discussing some of the results of his uh, uh, FEMSO research uh, fellowship, uh, as well as uh, some other elements that sort of feed into uh, his Crease capstone paper. Um, before I introduce Patrick, uh, I just want to say a few words. The, the FEMSO fellowship, um, I think most of you already know about it, but the, the deadline is today. Uh, this is a, an ongoing collaboration between uh, our Russian East European Eurasian Studies and the Foreign Military Studies Office. And, or Leavenworth. Um, uh, Ray Finch is our, our guy over there who works uh, with the fellows, uh, sort of overseeing the activity. Uh, they submit bi monthly uh, reports on uh, some of the scholarship and some of the reading they're doing. Uh, it's all open source material that they're looking at. Uh, it does involve, of course, uh, you know, reading knowledge and language, uh, but you're welcome to uh, apply for it. Uh, I'm not sure if you started right now, you get it in today, but I'll give you the information. I'll set it over here for you to take a look at. Um, it's, it involves a stipend. It's a, a really excellent program. Uh, Patrick comes to us from originally from the University of Wisconsin, uh, Whitewater with a BA in History in 2010, uh, and he's graduating this spring. Um, and the, the topic is, is an amazing topic. So uh, I'm going to turn this and talk about revolution. revolution. Thanks, Bert. And thank you all for coming. Um, I also thank you for your understanding with me not being able to present this last semester. Um, so since I wasn't able to present it at the original um, FIMSO presentation in the fall, I've kind of taken upon myself to develop the topic further as things have developed in Russia since, um, I think, October was the date of the original one. So the topic today is basically looking at social media and its effects on protest and civic activism in post-Soviet Russia with a few um, brief case studies involving um, the first and second Twitter revolutions in Moldova and Iran, and then moving to the Arab Spring revolutions, and then coming to uh, Belarus and finally Russia. Um, so for starters, uh, in 2009, in reaction to protests in Tehran, Andrew Sullivan of The Atlantic wrote that the revolution will be twittered. New technologies and social media have changed the way social, political, economic, and cultural interactions are conducted. They offer greater transparency, easier and faster international exchange of goods and information, and the ability to transcend boundaries of place and space with greater ease than the traditional media, um, mostly I'm meaning print journalism in this regard. Um, television and radio can usually do a pretty good job of transcending those boundaries, but there are limitations imposed by the government. Um, so is the goal of this study to understand how social media contributes to the creation of new civic identities, um, in particular political identities, and how they interact with political regimes. Um, so the importance of social media has grown considerably since the first and second Twitter revolutions in 2009 in Moldova and Iran, respectively. Um, further accelerated by the Arab Spring revolutions that began in 2011 and that continue today. Um, so I build upon these cases with a number of communications, sociology, and one um, political uh, theory um, in an attempt to create an, a common foundation for understanding social media as a tool of protest. Um, and then I turn to the media environments um, in each of the separate brief case studies before turning to Russia. So the main questions I'm concerned with in this study are what new technologies are employed by activists and how do regimes keep up with the dynamic digital environment? How do traditional media in Russia fare with the spread of the internet and increase in users of social media um, with sort of a caveat of is print journalism a dying form or does social media um, contribute to its evolution? Uh, the big question, does censorship exist in Russia today, and to what extent, and then what is the role of the government in Russia's media environment, and what can be done to ensure civil liberties regarding internet and information access. So, what is the digital revolution? 
Now, it's most often associated with um, the advances made in internet browsing and web-based services, but it also is um, linked to mobile telecommunications advances. As you can see from the statistics listed, uh, mobile phone subscribers numbered only 12.4 million, growing to two, in 2011 to 6 billion, which is 70% of the world population. Internet has grown astronomically um, as well, from 2.8 million to 2.2 billion today. Um, and the advancements made that allowed for this, um, to, this growth in users is basically just because of you know, economic reasons. The technologies are a little bit cheaper, and the advancements made make it more readily accessible to users. The other part of the digital revolution that I'm con more particularly concerned with is the evolution of the internet itself from Web 1.0 to Web 2.0. So in Web 1.0, you had just simple um, web pages that were often mostly text, and you could link via hyperlinks. So it was just a digital transportation device. Web 2.0 became more concerned with um, interoperability, uh, user-created designs, um, and collaboration, and the participatory information sharing. Um, so the greatest boom that I get into with this study is the boom in social networking as part of this Web 2.0 development. Um, so you have the development of social networking and file sharing websites such as LiveJournal, Blogspot, Facebook, Twitter, MySpace, YouTube, Contactia, Vimeo, etc., and so on. <laughs> um, so social media allow for quicker, easier, quicker and easier access to information, um, real-time global communication, and commerce. These are the pros. The cons, um, digital narcissism and amateurism, um, and inauthenticity, which is often associated with Wikipedia these days. Um, if anyone can update Wikipedia, you can basically say anything about anyone. Um, and creating an endless digital forest of mediocrity. These are the, the major cons of social media. Um, so, But despite these cons, they're still hugely popular, um, and they can serve almost any purpose that the user might have for them. Um, and here's just another set of statistics for internet users by region. Um, come back to that. So we'll move into some theoretical frameworks. Um, so Twitter itself is a fascinating tool. There are more than 300 million users tweeting 300 million times per day, um, which allows you to track information, ideas, etc., almost in real time. Um, largely, though, social media are attributed to global commerce and just um, building networks with people. So you, know, you can track celebrities, you can keep up with commercial interests, but the political potential seems low at times. Um, one instance is the top 10 user, li user list on Twitter. President Barack Obama comes in at number eight, which is surprising. You know, politicians do use it, and it is a very useful tool for their building of voting blocks. However, he's number eight among the likes of Lady Gaga, Justin Bieber, <laughs> Katy Perry, Shakira, Rihanna, Kim Kardashian, Britney Spears, Taylor Swift, and Nicki Minaj. Is there really political potential <laughs> in this cadre of users? Um, Peter Dahlgren believes there is, and most of the theories that I do believe there is political potential in social media. Um, as I stated before, there's this interspatiality that digital media transcends traditional boundaries created by media, or boundaries of place and space, allowing for new networks and communities to form, um, which can increase the civic identity. And this, he draws upon um, Robert Putnam's 2000 study, Bowling Alone, um, which talks about the revival of civic interaction in America um, from basically the post-World War II years through today, and how there was a decline in civic interaction by the lack of involvement in PTA meetings, churches, political parties, and so on. Um, so Dahlgren believes that social media can kind of revitalize this civic um, interaction. Um, one such way is the interaction between digital and traditional media. Um, so this kind of contributes to this evolution of 
the media in general. So social media isn't killing, you know, traditional forms of media. It's helping it evolve. Um, so one way he describes this interaction is through participatory uh, journalism and blogging. So you have the likes of CNN's iReporter. Um, Ria Novosti has the T Reporter program. Um, you have a huge blogosphere that contributes new information and I would argue much needed information in most um, countries where you have state owned or corporate owned um, media services. Um, now the, the pitfall of digital media for Dahlgren and a few of the other um, theories that I used is that digital communities and digital activists do not transcend the physical boundaries, so they don't move into the real world and produce real revolutions. Um, which Clay Shirky argues they do. Um, he notes that they aren't a replacement for real world action, but they're a quick and easy way to coordinate based on these four um, stages of development of online identities to synchronizing people based on interest, getting behind a common purpose, and then finally going out into the streets and taking action. In reaction to Shirky, we have Malcolm Gladwell of The New Yorker, who questions whether social media solved a problem that actually existed. Um, he notes, or he argues, that social media only create weak sociological ties. So you create these networks, but nothing really comes of them. He argues in favor of strong ties, which he gives the example of the civil rights movement in the United States as building this community based on a common interest with a, co with a single leader or vanguard of leaders, if you will, that take the burden of the protests and the actions upon themselves. Um, he does note, however, that social media is good for um, establishing uh, establishing a movement because of its anonymity. If you're anonymous on the web, then the authorities can't track you as easily and you know assign blame to a single person. However, there are ways that authorities usually do um, end up tracking down certain members. And if they can't find the actual leader, then they'll just place the blame on you. Um, so. This is the main, this is the second problem then, is which is stronger, a hierarchy or a network? He argues in favor of the former, um, noting that a movement with strong leadership, um, whether it's a single person or a party, um, will be able to more easily uh, go into the streets and lead to and lead activist demonstrations. So finally, we have Yevgeny Merozov who paints a pretty bleak picture of social media and the internet. Um, he writes that, or he offers this sobering thought that if social media, or about social media and toppling regimes, I should say, he writes that if an authoritarian regime can crumble under the pressure of Facebook, of a Facebook group, whether its members are protesting online or in the streets, it's not much of an authoritarian regime. Um, so basically in his book, his 2000 study, The Net Delusion on the Dark Sides of the Internet, he writes that technology is not neutral. Um, it's a double-edged sword that can be used for either the purpose of starting a movement or for the purpose of um, surveillance by the, the authorities and tracking down uh, opposition movements. Um, he also writes that to believe in the emancipatory capability of online communication with regard for its downside is naive and evidence of cyber utopianism, which Angela Davis describes as the internet, or describes as uh, the internet is an incredible tool, but it may also encourage us to think that we can produce instantaneous movements, movements modeled after fast food delivery. Um, so cases in which the internet played a crucial role in solidifying a protest movement and then succeeding in toppling a regime, or at least getting some type of political change to occur, has skewed um, Western observers in particular, but many observers' views of social media, which he calls internet centrism, which he, dis or he um, defines as the pernicious tendency to place internet technologies before the environment in which they operate. 
which gives policymakers the sense of a false sense of comfort, a false hope that by designing a one size fits all technology that destroys whatever firewall it sees, they will also solve the problem of internet control. So this bleak picture that Morozov paints then gets applied to uh, the Soviet Union in one part of his book. And he challenges the notion that's held by some, it's, there are some hardliners out there that hold this notion, but that the United States won the Cold War. He emphasizes the fact that it was liberation, or liberation from authoritarianism or oppression of any sort is best accomplished not by gadgets, but by facts. Um, it was not the Xerox machine that won the Cold War, and it will not be the smartphone-toting, Twitter-ready activists that will defeat authoritarianism today. Instead, it's the information cascade which will fell the beast. Um, so ordinary information, mere facts, can topple a regime from inside. So from the Soviet perspective, he uses the opening, of the, the partial opening of the archives as an example of how this information cascade can topple a regime, sort of. <laughs> there are other elements, of course. So now I just move towards a brief um, overview of social media and protests that come up as you track its development um, in recent history. Um, so one Egyptian activist from the Arab Spring Revolutions um, wrote how they used Facebook to schedule protests, Twitter to coordinate their demonstrations, and YouTube to tell the world. This is a commonly held um, fact among protesters that this is a the development, like the typical development of protest. So, um, the first Twitter revolution occurred in Moldova in 2009 as a result of fraudulent elections, which were going to give more power to the communist regime. So <coughs> pro-Romanian and pro-Moldovan supporters went to the streets and protested against one another and fought against one another. Um, included slogans such as, we want Europe, we are Romanians, done with communism. Um, when Moldovan TV was shut off by the government and there was fear that um, further repression was going to take place and further shutdowns were going to take place, one tweet from the protesters stated, North of Moldova TV is off, but we have the almighty internet. Let us use it to communicate peacefully for freedom. Um, after these kinds of tweets, then the internet was abruptly shut down in the capital. Um, but despite the crackdown and the violence that occurred thereafter, the, the role of social media had been supplanted, or had been strengthened in this movement. Um, and even Yevgeny Morozov, despite his bleak view of social media, kind of touted its power in helping um, fight against the communist, the fighting against the communist regime in Moldova. So the second Twitter revolution, which is most often considered the Twitter revolu revolution, was the Green Revolution in Iran in 2009. Um, the infamous quote by Andrew Sullivan, the revolution will be twittered, um, emerged from this revolution. Um, however, it fell upon silenced ears after um, Ahmad Nijad was re-elected and he began his crackdown. And then the opposition candidate, Mir Singh Musabi, was placed under house arrest where he remains to this day. Uh, and here's an interesting chart, I didn't really talk about this, but Iran has an interesting development of telecommunications. Um, it's, I think, one of the, the quickest growing in the world. Um, so it kind of explains the, the government's interest in kind of monitoring and keeping social media and other telecommunications networks under its control. So then Arab Spring 2011 to the present, um, we saw regime changes in four of the countries, um, with some outside interference possibly in particular ones. Um, most of them were fighting against absolute monarchy um, and or autocracy, kleptocracy. Um, they were fighting for civil liberties. Um, these are common trends among them. Um, but the power of social media um, is very evident in these locations. And they had the common slogan, people demand the removal of the regime um, across the Arab world. So then we turned to Belarus, where they had the silent and toy protests. These were um, a very interesting thing to follow over the summer while I was doing the FIMSO um, study. 
the revolution through social networks um, frequently returns in Belarus, but the, the authorities have social media and other media locked down pretty tightly. Um, so I just have two short clips of two protests that occurred in Belarus, one over last summer and one more recently. And it also displays the, the government crackdown on the protesters. It's, there's the tendency for more visible repression of opposition movements, which is a, is a changing trend in Russia now. In, in the early 90s, uh, crackdowns like this were a little bit more common, but now the media environment and the political regime in Russia are becoming more diversified, so they don't necessarily go to these extents when trying to quell a revolution or a protest in general. So, and the second one is a kind of an interesting comparison to studies I do for other courses where you have protesters mocking the regime. So you have Belarusian protesters placing toys in Square and Minsk. Um, eventually, they'll get their placards out. So to support in Belarus. So now we get to Russia. So the traditional media environment in Russia has changed considerably since the fall of the Soviet Union. It's more plural, more open. Um, the typical procedures towards protest of the authorities have become much less violent. Um, they prefer to uh, deal with protesters either preemptively, so arresting them before um, any protests can occur, or they just will shut down um, media outlets. Um, one example would be the Echo must be um, shifting out of the, the board of directors. So it's more, so the, the regime has become much more hybrid, which is a theory I take from Graham Robertson's most recent book, um, which is an attempt to manage dissent. So you're, the regime attempts to maintain the status quo by allowing open competition among its citizens, but it has to play this very subtle balancing act where they allow just enough open competition to see how the regime is performing so that they can retool their managing style to then you know, maintain their legitimacy um, at the head of the country. Um, traditional and new media continue to interact, um, so, which takes us to 
the most recent um, elections are the protests for cleaner elections, um, which are contesting parliamentary elections, which were declared fraudulent. Um, so let's see. I'm going to go back. Um, no, maybe not. Okay. All right, so the interaction between traditional and social media. Um, Morozov has a revealing um, quote from his book that says, even authoritarian governments have discovered that the best way to marginalize dissident books and ideas is not to ban them, but to let the invisible hand flood the market with trashy popular detective stories, self-help manuals, and books on how to get your kids into Harvard. Um, one thing that typifies the Russian media environment today is the influx of circus material, um, quote unquote circus material, a lot of tabloid politics. Um, so by flooding the market with these, um, this junk, basically, um, it keeps um, citizens unaware of some of the, the developments that could that are occurring um, so the parliamentary elections <coughs> that were declared fraudulent um, kind of opened up the box on this one and um, they saw the corruption that was occurring and they decided to finally fight against it um, so you had high-profile bloggers and socialites like Alexei Navalny, um, Ksenia Sobchak, Sobchak um, in more recent months that are coming out in support of these protests and using their their visibility within society to support the protests and attempt to change something in the Russian Federation. Social media allowed street protests to return to Russia. Um, they're more successful than, for example, the Occupy Wall Street movements, which have started through social media, where you have put, you have potential leaders that are visible, and after social media transcends that physical boundary and goes into street actions, they have someone that can kind of take the movement on their backs and lead. Um, and most recently, or in December, when Navalny was arrested, uh, director of Ekomoskvi, Alexei Benediktov, wrote that this was a political mistake on the regime's part because it transformed him from an online leader to an offline one. And his visibility within the Zachisny Vibari protests rose considerably after this. Um, so, what we have in Russia is the return of street politics aided by social media. Um, although early demonstrations may have been fueled more by a release of energy in reaction to another fraudulent election, but as, as protests continued, social media played a crucial role in organizing these, these protesters. Um, in Russia, the social media though, is also used by the regime, um, by pro-regime supporters, so Nashi in particular um, uses it to organize their own counter um, protests. Um, like I said before, Alexei Navalny and Ksenia Sobchik are using their celebrity status to aid the protests. Um, I have a video that was released, I think, last week of her by Ksenia Sobchik. And it's a dark satire of the Yagolosuyuza campaign videos of Putin. So, yeah, проголосовать за этого кандидата, потому что все-таки за это время экономика стала гораздо лучше в нашей стране, и жить стало лучше, и этот человек всегда был отзывчив к любым просьбам, и я думаю, он нам всем поможет. И, конечно же, особенно сейчас, перед угрозой оранжевой революции, сирийского и ливийского вариантов, И нельзя раскачивать лодку сейчас, и нужно всем вместе сплотиться вокруг одного лидера. Поэтому я приняла это непростое решение. Все, он нормально. Нормально. Молодец!
Так, ну что, камера нормально работала? Звук был? Да, да, нормально. Ну все, тащите Венедиктова. Давай, что, не украшу будет идти. So basically, just to translate, if anyone needs it. Um, so she says, I've decided to vote for this candidate because the economy and standard of living in our country have become much better. He has also, he has always been responsive to any request. He has helped us all. And especially now with the threat of an orange revolution like in Syria or Libya, we can't rock the boat. We must rally around one leader. This is why I made this difficult decision. As the camera pans out to reveal subject tied to a chair, um, the tough guy that enters in the leather jacket says, oh, nice job, pats her on the head, tapes her mouth shut, and they take her away. He asks if the sound was all right, asks if the camera was all right, and then tells them to bring in Benedictov for his promotional video of Putin's campaign. Um, so previously, videos like this released by Subcheck might not have been allowed to get onto YouTube before it disseminate via social media, but the media environment is much more open than it had been in previous years and previous elections, which allows opposition to uh, attempt to at least change public opinion from the status quo. However, the regime is right there with these movements in attempting to uh, sway public opinion to remain with Putin or whatever sitting regime is in power. So one of the questions is, is are the protests via social media in the streets of Moscow and throughout Russia today too little too late? Um, and will the protests have their desired effect? Or will Putin's predicted first round victory become a reality? Um, Oleg Kashin believes that we're all going to die under Putin. Um, he's a, a famous reporter for Commerçant. Um, and a uh, Ria Novosti reporter. Um, Okay, so Nikolai Troitsky is an analyst for Ria Novosti, and he argues against this internet centrism and cyber utopianism that Morozov talks about. He believes that um, protest and revolutionary capabilities should remain in the streets and not online. He believes that there's way more power in an actual physical um, protest, and he writes that you should not confuse technological progress with policy. Revolution does not live within technology. It is necessary to lay down an objective situation in which there is the impotence of the rulers and large-scale demonstration of solid masses. No civil society activists armed with iPhones, Androids, or other gadgets. Offline, that is, in reality, the authorities are simply catching everything, clearing them out, and suppressing them. And there is no alternative network that will help. Democracy like revolution cannot be exported overseas like fruit, which the local public organism is not accustomed to. It does not take root or it causes indigestion. That is the conclusion of my talk. <laughs> <laughs>